and welcome to the Velocity of Now with me, your host, Thomas Sheridan. It's the 5th of August, 2015, and tonight we'll be talking about a few things, but predominantly the show will be about dolmen. Yes, those, stra dolmens, th those strange megalithic rocks with the capstones that appear all over the world. Before I get to that, I want to talk about a few announcements and a few things that have happened lately. Firstly, on the last show, I said that many of you were, were seeing buses in your dreams and were on buses or buses that did not reach your de destination. It may be a bit of a stretch, but there was a, a, a quite what could have been a potentially a very serious bus accident in London yesterday when a tourist bus hit a tree and tore the roof off it. And it did make, it did make world news because it was full of tourists. So that may have been a hit in that regard. The dream stories are still flying in. Keep them coming in. I'm not going to do these dream announcements or dream predictions or whatever they want to call them on every week. It's every two weeks. And as I said, the thing will really come together in six months or so when we're able to look back and have our minds blown. But we, we probably got a hit there yesterday with the, with the, the bus thing. The China thing is still going strong. I don't know why, what's going on with China. It's a tricky one, but people are dreaming about Chinese and Chinese stuff still. But I'm not going to talk about too much about the dreams tonight, well, the, the, the dream experiment, the sleep experiment part of it. Now, last week I spoke about the, the phenomenon which I call the electrical night jesters, which is almost like a kind of a, an electronic clown... Uh, sorry about that interruption. We had a technical hitch. The signal dropped or something. Nobody's fault these things happen. And as I was saying, I last this last night I had an electrical night jester dream. And like all these electrical night jester dreams, they're very powerful emotionally. Now this one was very was very interesting because in the previous times I've had this dream. Uh, it's been a terrifying experience. This time it was the opposite. In my living room is a tall bookcase. About It's nearly seven feet tall, a wooden bookcase. And there's nothing on the top at the moment except boxes holding board games for playing. And in the dream, I was standing or sitting on the chair looking at that tall bookshelf. And on the top of it was what looked like a mechanical automaton of Pennywise the Clown with long red hair, which is kind of weird, uh, on top of the bookshelf, about 18 inches tall this automaton was, and it was it was mocking me. It was like waving its hands towards me and moving back and forth. And in the dream, my cat Billy Meep, the tabby, jumped up and grabbed the, uh, the the Pennywise automaton and pulled uh, and and he pulled it down to the ground and I burst out laughing in the dream. It was like one of these very sort of soul laughs when you laugh from the depth of your soul. Now I I think that's very powerful because when I've had these what I call electrical night jester, you can look at my blog to see the article about it electrical night jester type experiences the sense of terror is absolutely horrific but it's a weird kind of terror it's coupled with absurdity you cannot believe how absurd it is in the Whitley Strieber movie communion this kind of wind-up toy floats into his bedroom and comes as floating towards him as it's like making a kind of a mechanical noise and there always seems to be a spiral involved in these things for some reason. And this thing last night, this clown had, a, had spirals on it. And it, it, uh, he was laughing but also in terror and pointing at the thing saying, you can't be real, you're not fooling me, or something like that, Christopher Walken. It's, a, it's, exa it's, it's exactly what an electrical night jester experience in a dream feels like. So anyway, when the cat, my cat in the dream, Billy Meep, pulled the thing to the ground, the laugh that I, I would laugh in the dream was a kind of a laugh that was, it was like it came from the soul. 
it was a release of enormous amount of energy that this thing that could potentially have terrified me was brought down to the ground by my cat and uh, it was almost like this thing had no power for instance it, it was a small thing it was taken down by a cat so it lost its power so what does that mean in terms of that this this thing this entity this this archetype has lost its power over my consciousness now because i spoke about it last week and many of you short shared your, your your tales about it with me so that's a really really interesting thing and i, I wanted I, I wasn't going i was planning never to really tell you about my dreams on that you know in terms of the dream or sleep project but i wanted to tell you that one because it was significant and uh, so if you do dream of these sort of like mechanical electrical demons sucking the energy out of you and having tremendous uh, emotional intensity on you there's two sides to it they're also defeated and in the dream uh, and also there's an element of ridicule back towards them so that was that that was that last night's dream i had which was i thought was quite interesting and if you're interested no van you've had anything similar now another announcement today is that sorry about that and welcome back the uh, electrical internet radio jest gestures have been hammering us tonight either way there will be a, a very high quality recording of this on my youtube channel thomas sheridan arts uh, later on tonight so no harm done we'll get through this one way or another now I want to make a special announcement of an upcoming film project I'm involved in and I announced the day on my Facebook page and it's also on my website and many of you seem very excited about the idea the film that I'm making is with a guy if you're on my Facebook page you'll know about him he calls himself Mark McMark and he has a, web, a website called uh, McMark Metascience and he has come up with an idea for a film now the reason why I'm I'm putting my name behind this is because this guy is very similar to me in many wide ways we see things very very similar his idea about the history of these islands and Scandinavia and Northern Europe is very very similar to my own both very interested in the the tarot very interested in the idea that there was there was definitely a very different society particularly emanating from these islands when i say these islands i mean not scandinavia britain and ireland and possibly even possibly even iceland now then some kind of cataclysm that led probably to the collapse of doggerland that destroyed everything and the druids did survive but there was a tremendous corruption to have us absorbed into this idea that a real history emanated from the Middle East. And so he has come up with an idea for a film called The Mystery School Road Trip, where he will take with me as the host of the show, of the film, of the film, on a road trip around the north of England, where he will, and we will all prove for a fact, that they will see occult knowledge encoded in stone and metal by elite groups that is officially denied its existence. The group will visit a city purposely built as a giant occult ritual site on top of a sacred energy vortex, turning it into a hell mount. The group will see evidence that druids never went away, something I firmly believe myself and regular listeners of this show know that, like other resistance groups, went underground but in the Illuminati, what do you want to call it, the fight for our souls. And we will also see evidence of the cataclysm that decimated the advanced global civilizations based in the UK and Ireland that has been covered up with ancient stories of aliens and gods. And you know that's right up my street. And that's why I've decided to put my name behind this project. And we're, we're raising finances. We need a good bit of money because the, the purpose of this film is to make something that's cinematic quality, good enough for TV. There's two reasons for this. This thing will not be a truther film. It will not be a conspiracy theory film. It will be made to a very high level of broadcast, both in its look, if we get the money, 
and its presentation style. So there'll be none of that dun 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 conspiracy music and the number six six six. There, none of that nonsense. This is the real thing. It has been cracked. The evidence presented will be bulletproof. And that's the purpose of the high quality. It will be sent out. People will be able to watch it free online. There will be no downloadings once the thing is, is up, up and running. You'll be able to show it to your, your, your friends who think you're a nut. And they will not be able to dispute it. This thing will be seismic. It will be seen by millions and millions of people. The reason why we're rushing up and doing it and not announcing where it is is because what will happen is this evidence will be removed. And that's why we want to get the best quality film footage of these places and artifacts before the people or the individuals or the, the secret societies who guard them find out about us. So it's almost like a conspiracy road trip. A, sorry, a, a mystery school road script coupled with a kind of a, a guerrilla commando mission. And four people, four of you out there could be selected to be a part of it. To go down in history. You'll, you'll be able to take part in in this experience and then share it with the world. There will also be an embedded credible journalist from alternative media who will be there to act as kind of like a watchdog to show that it's all real and none of it is forged it's all the real thing and on my job will be to present this to present the film to be like the host in that style i'll be like the david attenborough and it should be mind-blowing it should be so powerful it will probably be if not bigger than holy blood holy grail was in the 90s remember when holy blood holy grail grail came out nobody knew about Rennes de la Chateau nobody knew really about Rosalind Chapel nobody knew about the Knights Templars and now you have things like the Da Vinci Code and it's common world knowledge everybody's into this stuff this will be the same thing it'll take it to that level and maybe even beyond so if you want to contribute to the GoFundMe and I'll push the link below at the bottom of the screen. Anything you can help. I often get people saying to me, do I take donations? No, I don't. But if you want to give money towards a film and be part of something amazing, you can go to the GoFundMe page. If you go to thomasheridanarts.com, you will see on the side something saying special announcement. Click there and you get all the details on the film. And you'll also get all the, in, the, the play, things you can join, like the Facebook page and so on for updates as well as the direct link to the GoFundMe page. I'll also post this link below this video on YouTube so you'll see it below here so you can get to it. This is going to be enormous. This is not some this is not a decision I took lightly to be a part of this. It's you know me, I'm probably the most conservative person in the scene. I mean I don't do the aliens thing. I've no interest in that I don't believe any of that is real. Or any of that stuff, and I'm very vocal against the flat earth people and all that kind of thing. However, I'm an old fashioned conspiracy theorist, and I research and I work in facts. I don't channel messages from aliens, I don't channel messages from gods, I don't do psychic work, I don't do anything like that. I ignore all that stuff. I go back to the earliest documents and books I can find. And I dig out the stuff. And Mark does the same too. So what you're going to get, it'll be pure quality. Absolutely. It'll also blow your mind. Because it's going to open a can of worms that will never be opened. And it may, you know, it, it'll, it'll lead to healing. It'll lead to healing to show that people on these islands are all the same. We all come from a similar kind of root. And all the things put on top of that, like nationalism and religion and all regionalism that was piled on top of that is nonsense. We were a, 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 a an amazing civilization that had Irish Sea. On one side was the trade based around the Irish Sea and the other side between Britain and Ireland, Scotland and Ireland, the Isle of Man. And on the other side, the North Sea between Scandinavia and Britain and Scotland. And... It was. This is what the harrying of the North 
that took place in the in the time of William the Conqueror was about. It was to go to the north of England, as was the successive genocides that took place in Ireland, particularly the harrowing of the north. That was to go up there and to remove the indigenous North British population, so there'd be no trace of this remarkable civilization would ever be remembered by anyone. This is why they smashed up stone circles, monuments, you name it, and all the truth was, was hidden. The same thing happened why they re replaced the Scottish Highlanders with sheep later on. The same idea, all the handed down knowledge was gone. The same thing that happened in Ireland. You had decimations of population. It came later. It was it was not as a there was not the same sense of expediency to wipe the Irish out because of the, we had a different language. But there was for people in the north of Britain because they spoke English and they had to be sorted out right away. And that's why the, the British Empire began by conquering the north of England. That was they were the first victims of the British Empire, and so. If you want to be a part of something that's just, it's going to blow your mind because there's nothing like that out there. Out there, there'll be nothing like this yet. And it won't be something in a far off land about the Middle East or any a Tibet or any of that nonsense. If you live on these islands or in Scandinavia, it will be about the soil under your feet. You do not have to go looking at maps of Babylon anymore and listen to that nonsense. You will not have to be bothered with nonsense about about Tibet, or you'll be able to find your true spiritual, social, and cultural traditions on these lands. You will no longer be a psychological and spiritual refugee. We're going to come home. So please fund the film if you can. Mystery School Road Trip. It's an associate Mark Mac. McMark Meta Science in association with Thomas Sheridan Arts. We'll hopefully get the film out this year and go to my website, Thomas Sheridan Arts, and and be a part of your own salvation. And also that includes people who have heritage their heritage and roots are in this part of the world. Their background is from northern Iberia, where our original ancestors came from, to Iceland, to Scandinavia, to the British Isles, to the Irish Isles, wherever you want to call it. And northern France, this is it, Denmark. This is it, Jutland. This, this is this is your stuff. Your ancestors came from there. You no longer have to pretend that you're in a Tibetan or a Native American or an Egyptian or a Babylonian or a, a, a Semite anymore in order to have spirituality and a, and a sense of home, because we're going to give it to you. And then we're going, and then we're going to move on. Now, so that's that's the film, Mystery School Road Trip. And one more thing is that there, a a body has been found in Manchester in the Canal today on Ashton on the Lime in the Portland Basin. So we're getting nearly that's up to nearly seventy bodies of men have been fished out of the Manchester canals since two thousand and nine. Now, the details are still sketchy. They said it was a man. They did not mention the age group. The Portland Basin is a, is a large canal basin. I think it's in like the northeast of Manchester, out by Staley Bridge direction. Now, heading towards Yorkshire. I have been... I've had some interesting... Uh, Experiences with the mainstream media over this story. My blind spot documentary film, short film, has got a lot of attention in high places, mainly because it's 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 do it's it's getting people in Manchester to ask the police why they're not doing anything. And sorry again for that interruption. Uh, we'll just keep on moving on. I don't know what's going on tonight. Apparently, the signal is being. Messed with on both sides. We'll persevere no matter what. The bastards won't shut us down. Now, as I said, uh, the the interest in the blind stuff bot film has alerted people in mainstream media, and in, there seems to be an interest in me. The first thing that happened was a an a journalist from a Manchester media outlet, one of the biggest ones interviewed me was very very sympathetic towards my uh, 
my theories and very praising of my film and very direct and honest with me in being candid about the relationship between the media there and the police regarding this issue. I can't go into any more because the email exchanges have a, 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 a basically a, a non-disclosure rider in the bottom of them, so I'm, I can't go into more detail about that. Uh, but we'll, I don't know what's going to develop there. If it'll be printed or not, it's been on the, the editor's desk for a, a couple of weeks. I don't know if it's in the bin. But another thing that's happening is, and this is a danger and why I'm very wary of the mainstream media, is a, a journalist from one of the larger British gutter press tabloids has been sniffing around me, contacting people on my Facebook page, uh, this kind of thing, trying to find people who knows me. Uh, probably as part of, of, of sussing me out because of the film. What the agenda er, there is, I don't know, but it's a scumbag newspaper with it that's had a long, many decades of a scumbag agenda. So if anything goes on there, it should be interesting. Either way, I'm not bothered because the fact that the blind spot film is getting this attention is a very good thing because unlike the scumbags in mass media, not all of them, some of, most of them, I'm much more interested in saving lives than trying to shut down another person's journalism, shall we say. And that's what that's really about. You see, journalists, a lot of them get jealous when they see something like my blind, blind spot film. They know that they will never be allowed to do that level of investigative journalism. They went to journalism school. They've never reached that level. They've never been able to do it. It would never be out there. And so they're, they're completely censored and unharnessed. So they have a, a vendetta, a, you know, vendetta. You see, it's like David Icke this week has been, to his credit, vindicated with the the whole Ted Heat thing. Now, these half the reason these journalists would have called him a nutcase for years was because they knew about Ted Heat. And they knew they could never say anything about it, but he could. So, so much freedom in the alternative media. Why anyone would want to become a mainstream media, media person, journalist, is beyond me. But anyway, so that's the development there. Unfortunately, another body was found in the, in the canals today. And the mainstream media are very, very interested in my blind spot film. Now, as an update to that, tomorrow night on Capricorn Radio... I don't do, as you know, I've kind of retired from doing all media interviews. But I've, I'm coming out of the closet for this one just because I want to talk to James Swagger about this latest update that's happened in Manchester and the, and the developments and a bit more background information on what I believe to be at least the possibility of a serial killer working in that city. Now, it's nearly halfway through the show. We'll probably run over a little late tonight. I want to now go to what the main topic tonight was, is dolmens. Now, dolmens have always fascinated me, just like all megaliths. But in the last few years, what has really struck me about the dolmens is just how common they are. They're not just common to Britain and Ireland not just common to northern Portugal, to northern Iberia, to Galicia, not just common to other parts of Europe. They're everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. There, there's some enormous ones in Russia, and some massive and incredible ones have been found in Korea. But they're everywhere. You look everywhere. The same idea, a large stone suspended above the ground, usually held up by three other stones. The strangest thing, they look, the, now, th there's no reason why these things should be built. There's many, many ways you can build a stone monument. There's many ways you could arrange stones in a specific, impressive way by piling them on top, on top of one another. But for some reason, people all over the world went to enormous lengths to construct these stone megaliths, these stone edifices, using more or less the same technique, which is the most difficult way of making them of all. Of all. Now tonight I'll be specifically speaking 
about the ones on these islands. They're the ones I know the best. These are the ones I've had first hand experience with. And so I, I, I'm not an experienced, I'm not a, an expert on the other ones, but I want to talk about some theories I have regarding them. Now, if you've seen a picture of a dolmen or what a film of a dolmen, you visit one, basically it looks like a three legged stone table. And on top, there's a capstone. Sometimes it's flattened off, other times it's round. It's actually quite more common, but it's, it's sometimes it's absolutely massive. There's one in Ireland that weighs 160 tons on top of one of them. Just think about that. Now, like all the megalithic monuments built in these islands, the time frame that they were built across is absolutely immense. We're talking maybe even 4,000 years of them being built. 4,000 years of relative peace, I might add as well, with little or no evidence of warfare during the time of the megaliths. But yes, tremendous evidence of mass construction, social organization, and obviously healthy, strong societies. Because you wouldn't be able to build them otherwise. In Ireland alone, there's between 50 and 60,000 megaliths that we know of. Just think about that. Just in Ireland, there's between 50 and 60,000. And it may have been much, much more. But these are the ones that we know about, that the remains are still found. And of the dolmens of several hundred, including ones up in the mountains here, they're just magnificent. There's so many of them are photographed because they're photogenic or in certain locations. But other ones are in the middle of bogs and fields and surrounded by woods. And they're there. They're, and they're, they're just as incredible. Now, it's almost like the dolmen in a megalithic... A megalithic... Uh, collection of megaliths it's almost like certainly in ireland that the dolmen seem to be built firstly and then after the dolmen has been built and it's, it seems to be successful cairns that's the underground passages seem to spring up all around them but the the initial sort of like element is generally a dolmen now, what's interesting is that in both Ireland and Wales, dolmens are called portal dolmens. Now, I find that term very, very interesting. Now, a portal, when you think of a portal, you think of a portal into a train tunnel, the opening of the train tunnel into the side of a mountain, or the opening of a road tunnel into the side of a mountain is called a portal. A portal is also... The idea of moving between one state and the other. And this to me, when they call them portal dolmens, the ones in Irish, Ireland and Wales, I think they've actually given us. A, it's one of these secret truths that they say, oh, it's a portal dolmen, meaning there's a home in it. But it's also these people that we're going to be exp exposing it that in this movie these druids who work within the elite to try and slip out secrets to us, they call it a portal dolmen because it is a gateway to another reality. You do not go to the trouble of lifting, in one case in Ireland, 160 ton stone pieces, mount them on three uprights, the capstone there was 160 tons and mount them on three uprights in hundreds maybe even thousands of locations on these islands for no other reason than they must serve a real function they can't just be simply there for design or religion or to celebrate a king Especially when you look at how they were constructed. How the, the dolmen, now this, this, let's talk about the art. The Irish dolmens tend to be massive. They're really big here in Ireland. Where the Welsh ones tend to be more elegant and taller. 
and then some of the many of the do, many of the dolmens in and it's the same story again the earlier they are the better they're built and as time progresses the construction standards are not as good as the initial early ones it's generally agreed upon by academics and i i agree with them too that the construction this is the latest theories and i think is the best one yet the previous belief was that a, a large stone was found somewhere, brought to the site, and then levered up. And then the three, the usually the three, you know, leg stones, the pivot stones they were on, pushed underneath. Now the evidence is suggesting something very different and something much more significant. That the, the stone was already in the ground. Like it was a large boulder that was laying in the ground, maybe with some of it buried under the earth and the, and the rest of it exposed above the earth. Now this is significant because in the ancient religions of our ancestors, remember a few weeks ago I spoke about the tree that had been found inverted upside down, a tree henge in England on the east coast of England and how that signified the tree as above so below the roots and the branches the roots extending into the supernatural world the world of ancestors the world of death the world beyond the veil and the upper part of the tree in this reality tying very nicely into the Yggdrasil tree mythology of the Norse the same thing would apply with the stones you see these people believe that st Stones were not inanimate objects to these people. They were, they were alive and conscious to the people. They were repositories of ancient stories and lives. And when they would see these was one large stone in the ground, with some of it sticking above the ground and some of it below the ground, it, it seemed to them, and this is my theory, this is not the academic one, that the part below the ground represented the stone in the other reality, in the in the other world, beyond the veil, in the world of shadow and magic and mysteries and the ancestors. And the part above it, just like the top of a tree that where the roots are not, was its penetration into this reality. So this large capstone lying on the ground would have been seen to have both the aspects and the attributes of being both in this world and in the supernatural world and this would have made it what a portal a portal dolmen there's there's plenty of evidence they would dig up around the stone and then it lift it up they don't know the methods, but it's it's per, you know people say they used like they had anti magnetism and all this kind of thing or sound waves. It's it's quite possible with the right lever to lift tremendous weights up in the air, and then you could just pack them with soil on the knee until you have them to the right height, and then you insert the three uprights. When the three uprights were inserted, and then the soil was scraped away to reveal the dolmen structure as we know them now. What's really interesting is that the undersides, in most cases, had been chipped away. Someone had got underneath the stone while it was raised up because they found flakes of stone all over, all over these sites and chipped away to deliberately flatten the underside of the stone, almost to tune it or something like that. But it may have had another function. Remember, if that stone was in the world of the supernatural, the world of shadow, any flakes of stone that came off that would contain the attributes of the other side, and therefore they would have been prized relics. It would have been a stone. They would have been supernatural amulets, a, a, a gem or a piece of stone from another reality that you could have. So it was deliberate shaping of the underside. 
So the, un the underworld was brought into this world. And you had a portal into the other world. What happened then, and this is probably why the Cairns went around it. And my theory is that when people, when the, when the, like in Penny Abandon in Wales, there's an enormous dome and you can stand up under it. There was one here in Sligo that was destroyed in the 1950s. But there were, some of them were so tall you could actually stand up inside them. But if you, if you were to go underneath the capstone, beneath the three uprights, you yourself were then in the world of the ancestors and you could go on a vision quest. They were, they were telephones to the other side. They were, you were, you were, it was like a TARDIS. It was just like a stone TARDIS and you were inside it. And when you were inside underneath that dolmen, you were no longer in this reality. And this is probably why the Irish mythology of the st story of Dermid and Grania is that for a period of time they lived under a dolmen while they were being chased across Ireland because if they had eloped. Maybe, just maybe, that indicates that when a person was under the dolmen, the law could not touch them, that they could not be touched because they would be respected and recognized as not actually being in this reality. They had entered into the world of the fairies, of the two of the Dana. They were in a different reality. They had passed through the portal in the portal dolmen. The larger or the greater or the greater the weight of the capstone at the top would indicate that there was more of, you see, there wouldn't be just a matter of putting the biggest stone they could possibly get on top. If you look at the Irish ones that are up to 160 tons, they're not very thin stones. We often see photographs of the dolmens are often thin. They're almost, some of them are almost uh, boxes or footballs. They're huge, they're massive. And that would have indicated that when they were lifted, they would have had the reason why they went for bigger ones and higher is because they wanted the the stones that had the most of their mass under the ground and therefore the most of their mass in the supernatural world. So when they were raised up, they contained a greater frequency, should we say, range of the realities or the, the 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 mystical insights of the supernatural world, and this has been. If you look at the Welsh ones, that tend to be higher. The stone on the top tends to be wider. The the, the capstone. So they, but the the area, the area would still apply that even though it wasn't a very thick stone. If it was a, a large stone covering a wide area, it would still have the same amount of its undersurface in the supernatural world. Where the Irish ones, like you see a Carrow Keel, it's like a ball. It doesn't matter. Maybe most of that was under the ground. You're still achieving the same effect. The raising of the height could be show prestige. The raising of the size. I mean, it's still amazing to me. They got a hundred. I know. I know it's technically possible with levers to get, but they get a hundred and sixty tons. Up in the air, try that today with the with the latest machinery, and then to put in an element of fine tuning. There's an element of fine tuning to it. These things were almost like the center of the community. Now there's also evidence where dolmens collapsed during construction, or they were erected, and the dolmens fell apart. Something happened. They structurally weren't good enough. The bottoms fell away. And then the communities who built them vanished. They had no interest in them. It was only, a, a dolmen had to work or it was no use to the community. There was no half-built or broken dolmen that was tolerated. If they lifted a dolmen up and it's broke, snap, fell over, or, or sunk into the ground after a while, the whole, the whole site would be abandoned and no cairns would be built around it. This thing was the center of their communities. Now you don't go to that trouble just 
for you don't go into that trouble unless it has a profound impact on the society now the great the great age of building cathedrals starting in the gothic period the big stone cathedrals and running right through to the renaissance the reason why the powers that be allowed these these cathedrals to get bigger and bigger and get more complex and with more increasingly complex and dynamic engineering was because these were and also employing thousands and thousands of stonemasons this was because these skills in building these large cathedrals was also very useful for building fortifications castles for the elite to be behind so it was in the interest of a duke or a king or a baron or someone with enormous power to commission and to help fund an enormous cathedral in Europe somewhere in the Gothic era, in the Middle Ages era, in the in, in right into the Renaissance for two reasons. One, he could be get on the good side of the church by saying this great man, you know, Count so and so, paid for the the building of this and, and his family for this enormous Gothic cathedral that took four or five hundred years to build and employed so many stonemasons. That was one element of it. The other element of it was that it gave them the ability and the skills training to build enormous fortifications and castles all of them to protect themselves. So ultimately, these, uh, these stonemasons who were building these enormous cathedrals around Europe were actually building their own pens because they were on the outside and they could never, if they ever tried to re revolt against the the power structure, the power structure was hidden behind a wall that these people themselves built. It wasn't the same with the Megal. And also, that you know, that did not stop war. The evidence war, was, there were more castles that were built, the more cathedrals that were built, the more wars happened. In reality, with the Dolmans, the reverse happened. There's almost 4,000 years of no evidence of war in Ireland, and the same in Britain, during the building of the megaliths. These people knew something. These people had insights and secrets. 4,000 years, and remember, these were complex societies. If you're going to build something, if you're going to build a dolmen, that's weighs 160 tons and it's lifted up in the air. You need a stable food source. You need plenty of healthy citizens, manpower, and you need a sense of organization that people will build this thing without thinking about it. During the building of the great cathedrals, they didn't build it so they'd get to heaven. They built it for money. And yet these dolmens were built in a pre-monetary system. There was no apprenticeships. There was nothing like that. Everybody was involved for some reason. And they built them. And even the corruption of everything. Some of these are surrounded by what they call ring forts. And yet there's no evidence that these were used for fortification. It's, it's the same reason they call them burial tombs. The burial tomb, you know, the burial cairns, they're not. Maybe later on in some of them bodies were... Were, were, were put in them but we don't know what they were for they could they were probably almost certainly to, for people to go on visions vision quests it our ancestors on these islands and i'm sure around the world as well but i, I this i only know about the ones in these islands didn't only live in this reality they lived beyond on both sides of the veil and they became aware of insights on the other side of the veil that stopped them having wars and live in peaceful cohabitation. That's, that absolutely is the evidence from Ireland, is you had thousands and thousands of clans and family groups building these stop megaliths, Building these beaut now, as we're finding out from the Irish uh, folk park and uh, folk folk heritage museum, beautiful, elegant wooden structures, living next to each other in peace. When the reality is they should have been at war, 
for 4,000 years building megaliths. And I'm sure it was happening in Iberia and all the other places megaliths were built. This is why we're making this film. We're going to uncover that secret. This is why I have these dream and sleep experiments. I myself am trying to move all of us into a more full existence of what it means to be a human being. Yes, we have our everyday reality, but we also have our sleeping reality, and we have not, we no longer in touch with that. We just fall asleep and think it's a period of rest when it's so much more. If this, what they call, so this, 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 whatever you want to call this movement now or this scene, in my opinion, should stand for anything. It should be the greatest truth of all. And the greatest truth of all is that we're not destined to live the way we live right now. The greatest truth of all is that we capture our full world. And we live. See, we don't have to employ. You don't have to employ, employ a shaman. If that's how you live your own life. You don't have to go on a spiritual quest. And look for a guru. If you are able to move between beyond both sides of the veil, both sides of the curtain, both sides of the shadow. This is what our ancestors did. Before something, either a supernatural a natural cataclysm or something, wiped them all out and allowed the infection from Rome and the Middle East to conquer these islands. It was probably related to what happened in Doggerland. And the whole collapse of that society to the North Sea probably created some kind of seismic shock wave that damaged people all over this part of Europe. We'll never know. Well, we'll we're going to try and find out. Our ancestors were were much more elegant, dynamic, spiritual, peace loving. And we're very, very far from the barbarians that, and the, the, the wild savages, the wild murderous savages that they were portrayed as when the Romans and then the rest of them came along. They were probably more powerful than they even got at the height of the British Empire. I mean, the original ancestors. But something happened. Something changed that. And that's why I make a big deal of studying Gaelic mythology. I mean, unfortunately, Anglo-Saxon mythology was wiped out with the harrying of the North. But anything like that, Norse mythology, anything. Because that plus the deceptions created by the ruling elite, in particular the Jesuits, ever since then, and looking for the inconsistencies and the traits and what they, when the great way to discover the truth, I've always found, if the elites, if the elites are pointing over here, look over here to the left, you must look over to the right, and it may, the answer may not be in the right, but it might be in the middle. It'll all, you know, you, you'll get to it. it, but it won't be where they're pointing and telling you to look. In our case, they're pointing towards the Middle East. Look towards Babylon, Babylon, look towards the Middle East, look towards the Middle East, that's where all the religion is. Look towards Tibet, get your jungle juice in Peru. They never ever want us looking at what we are and who we are and where we came from in this part of the world. Because they fear it greatly. And that's why they decimated Stonehenge by building a road next to it. That's why they decimated New Grange by doing this bizarre 1960s brutalistic architectural facade on the front. This is why so many dolmens have been torn down and wrecked and often find themselves on military lands for some very strange reason. The veil does not belong to them, for them alone to cross. The veil belongs to you and me and everyone else. And we have the ability to cross on both sides. And it's only by changing our consciousness 
to not one of ex of a believing we need a guru or needing salvation from outside but moving with inside us and seeing the world in those all those magical terms for instance tonight one of my friends posted on a Facebook page mentioning the relationship between Jimmy Savile and Ted Heat and I posted that was just a reflection at the top of a society polluted society what was going on at the bottom you had Ian Brady and Moira Hindley at the bottom Jimmy Savile and Ted Heath at the top as above so below pathologically entwined from the top of society to the bottom we have to demolish that instead of demolishing our megalithic structures and our dolmens. That is the foundations we have to undermine. And it's time for us to dig back into the ground and pull out the roots of who we were meant to be and not what they have unsuccessfully tried to make us in their image. So the day comes when we're no longer thinking about the monsters and the psychopaths at the top of society and how they relate to the ones at the bottom but how we're able to think about our lives in this world and how it relates to the lot where our lives beyond the world of sleep shadow and dreams thanks very much please 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 visit my website and click on the link below and contribute to this film project because it really will be a wonderful thing and I'll see us next week take care of yourself and feck them if they think they could joke <laughs>